Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in today's video we're going to be carrying out a stress analysis on a wind turbine shaft. We're going to be using finite element analysis in order to determine where our principal stresses occur and also the magnitude of those principal stresses. So displayed on the screen here we have a drawing entitled Solid Low Speed Shaft and we're going to produce this first of all as a model in Fusion 360 and then we're going to prepare that model for a finite element analysis. So as we can see here, the shaft section has a length of two and a half meters and a diameter of 140 mil. And attached to one end of the shaft, we have a flange of diameter 750 millimeters. And we have six bolt holes on a bolt circle diameter of 625 millimeters. Each of those bolt holes has a diameter of 40 mil. So first of all, let's translate what we have on the drawing into a model in Fusion 360. So here we are in Fusion 360, and I'm going to begin by producing the shaft section, and then we'll add the flange onto the end of the shaft. So I'm going to create a sketch, and I'm going to select a plane to sketch on. I'm going to produce a circle of diameter 140 millimeters to represent the shaft. I can exit my sketch and then I'm going to extrude that through a distance of two and a half meters or 2,500 millimeters. So there we have the shaft. Next we're going to produce the flange and in order to produce the flange I'm going to need to sketch on one of the ends of this shaft. So if I move the shaft into the center of the page and orbit then I can position this so that I'll be drawing on the correct end of the shaft. I'm going to create a sketch. This time I need to make sure that I select the face of the component that we've already produced rather than the work plane. And this time I need to produce a circle of diameter 750 millimeters to represent the outside diameter of that flange. Now we have a couple of options here. I could extrude the depth of the flange, which is 50 millimeters, and then add the holes or I can add the holes to my sketch. And that's what I'm actually going to do in this instance. So if I shift my view, so I can see more clearly what I'm doing, I'm going to create another sketch, and this is going to be the center lines for our six holes. This has a diameter of 625 millimeters. And I have six holes that I need to place on this diameter. I'm going to place one of these in the top center, and each of our holes has a diameter of 40 millimeters. But then I'm going to create a circular pattern to position the five remaining holes. So I create circular pattern. I select my hole first of all, then my center point, and then I specify the number of instances that I need. We have the option here to suppress, but I don't want to suppress or remove any of those holes. I want all six to appear. And then I can click OK. Now what we notice is that we have our sketch for the outside of the flange and we also have our sketch for our six holes. So I'm going to finish my sketch. So next I need to extrude this and I need to be careful what selections I make for this extrusion. If I highlight these three areas here, here and here, then you can see that all of the flange is selected with the exception of the six bolt holes. And that's exactly what I want because when I extrude this, the material is going to be missing from those bolt holes. I need to extrude this through a distance of 50 millimeters. And I'm going to select join in my options because I want the shaft and the flange to all be one component. And click OK. As an alternative, I could have created the flange and then cut the holes afterwards, but the end result's the same. There's more than one way to create this component. So what we have now is a model of the component that we saw previously on the drawings. And what we're going to do next is we're going to prepare this for an FEA analysis. So we need to switch to our simulation mode. And we're going to do a static stress study. So there's a few different settings that we need to apply here. If we refer to the top panel, we have materials, constraints, loads and contacts. Now contacts only apply when we have more than one component and we'll come on to that later in the video. 
but we do need to specify materials, constraints and loads. The material at present is set as steel and we're going to leave the component as steel for the time being. So we can click OK. We need to add our constraints. Now what we're going to be doing is applying a torque to this shaft. So how we're going to specify our boundary conditions is we're going to have a fixed constraint on this surface here and we're going to apply the torque to the face of the flange. So first of all, this end of the shaft here needs to be a fixed constraint. We select constraints, we select the face, and we specify here that it's a fixed constraint and we'll see the symbol of the padlock to represent the fixed constraint. Next to the other end, we need to apply a torque to the outside face of the flange. So if we rotate this slightly, and we're going to apply a load, and we need to switch the load type from Forbes to Moment. A moment is a turning moment or a torque. The target is the face. And for the purpose of this study, we're going to apply a torque of 12,750 newton meters. So I need to switch the units, it's currently in newton millimeters. And the magnitude is 12,750. So now what you'll be able to see is we have the padlock applied here for the fixed constraint and we have a torque being applied to the outside face of the flange. Now that we've specified our constraints and our loads, we can move on to look at the mesh. We're going to generate a mesh first of all, and if you recall, at each of those nodal points on the mesh, a calculation is going to be done of the stress on this component. The mesh that we've got defined here, we can check by editing the mesh, and we can see that we've got a mesh that's defined as 10% average element size. Now we're going to run the simulation with a 10% mesh, but then we're going to reduce it to a 3% mesh in order to compare our results. So with everything specified, we can now solve the simulation. Once the simulation is complete, we can view our results. So if we close the window here, it's telling us we have an actual minimum safety factor of 4.58, which is fine. And we can see the places where our principal stresses occur because that will be where our factor of safety is at a minimum. So we can see that that really applies to the outside of the shaft here. There's various different ways we can view the results and those are covered in some of the fusion tutorials that you may already have completed. But what we can switch between is we can switch between safety factor and stress. Here we can see the stress distribution on the shaft with the maximum stress on the outside of the shaft particularly closest to the contact point with the flange. And we can also view our displacement or our deflection and the maximum deflection is noted on the outside of the flange here, which is what we would expect as that has the larger diameter or the larger radius. So let's focus specifically on the stress. What we can see here is that we have a maximum stress of 45.2 megapascals. What we're going to do next is repeat the simulation with a more refined mesh to see how that affects the results and see if a more refined mesh is actually preferential. Recall that a more refined mesh will give us more accurate results, but it takes a greater amount of time to compute. So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to finish viewing the results and I'm going to modify the mesh that we already created. I don't need to create a new study because I'm not making any modifications to this component and I'm also not modifying any of the loading conditions. So instead I'm going to edit the mesh and I'm going to change this to a 3% average element size. If I drag this down, 2%, 3%, click OK. And then I need to regenerate the mesh. So if I go to generate mesh again. And our mesh is now up to date. What we do notice though, is that our results are out of date. And that's because we've changed the mesh. So we need to resolve. And then we can determine the stress with the more refined mesh. Okay, so we can see that our safety factor is still comparable, 4.59. And we can see that our maximum stress is also comparable. 
we see here that the maximum stress on this component is now 45.1 megapascals, whereas previously it was 45.2 megapascal. What this indicates for this particular geometry is that there's no real benefit in refining the mesh. We get the same results. We can identify where the maximum stress is occurring, and we can identify the magnitude of that maximum stress. And the results are very similar to with our coarser mesh. Generally what we would do is we would refine that mesh in increments until we find the optimum and balance of the speed with which results are created and the accuracy of those results. Okay, so I'm going to do one more thing in this video and this is to introduce contacts. So if we finish the study, so what I'm going to do is produce a second identical shaft and I'm going to place it end on end with the existing shaft so that the flanges are in contact. What we're simulating here is that the two shafts are going to be bolted together using the bolt holes so that in effect they're fixed in place. One shaft won't be able to rotate or won't be able to have a torque applied to it independently of the other. So I need to return to the design workspace and the first thing that I'm going to do is duplicate this shaft. So if I go to modify, move or copy and select the component. I need to remember to click create copy down here and I'm producing a duplicate of that shaft. It doesn't matter where I place it for the time being because I need to rotate this and place the flanges together for the two shafts. So I click OK. Now again I'm going to do a move function but this time I'm not creating a copy. I'm going to move this component and this time rather than a lateral movement I need to rotate the component. I want to rotate this about the z-axis, but at the moment there aren't any pickable options. So what I'm going to do is click the visibility icon alongside the origin. And you'll notice now that I can see the origin. And because I can see the origin, I can pick the axis here, the z-axis to rotate about. And I'm rotating 180 degrees. Like so. Now the final step then is to place these two shafts together. And the way that I'm going to do this is by using another move function, but I'm going to use something called coincident points, where a particular point on one shaft is going to be aligned with the same point on the other shaft. And I'm going to focus in on this bolt hole at the bottom here. So I'm doing modify. Move. I'm going to move one shaft until it's in contact with the other, and I'm using this option here, point to point. We've got the origin point. Now the origin point is going to be a point on the surface of this hole, but I need to make sure that I can pick the center of the hole on the opposing surface. I'll show you what I mean here if I rotate this a little more so that we can see the other hole. I need to select the start point as the underside of this circle. So here I'm going to select the underside of the circle and its target point is going to be the opposing circle here. It's going to bring those two circles or those two edges together, like so. Click OK. And now I can see that the two flanges are in contact with each other and the other thing that I can check is that the holes are aligned. So as I rotate this round, we can see that the holes are aligned because we can see right the way through the part. Okay, let's prepare this for simulation. So we're going to return to the simulation workspace. Now, as you remember before, we had to specify materials, constraints, and loads. The problem this time is that we're creating a new study because this time we have two components in contact with each other. So before we begin, we need to create a new simulation study. We're going to do another static study. And we're going to go through exactly the same process as we did last time. This time, we're going to leave our materials as steel. We're going to fix one end of the first shaft and we're going to apply the torque to the other end of the other shaft. Then what we need to do is tell the model that these two surfaces of the flanges are being clamped together or they're fixed, meaning that they don't rotate independently of each other. So first of all, we're going to apply a fixed constraint 
to this end of the shot. So constraints, fixed, select the face and click OK. Next, we're going to apply our load to the other end. So we rotate the shaft. I'll just bring this into view so you can see the surface we're working on. And I'm going to apply my load or my torque to this end of the shaft. So I select the face. I'm going to apply a moment. I'm going to switch my units to Newton meters. And we're going to use the same load 12,750. Okay, so in theory, if we're applying a torque of 12,750 to this shaft, then we're applying a torque of 12,750 to the flange, and we want that 12,750 to transfer to the opposite flange. The loading on this right hand shaft here is the same as it was previously in effect if everything else remains constant. So before we can run the simulation, we need to tell the fusion that these two plates are fused, and we're going to use something called contacts. Now by default, the contacts that will be assigned are fixed contacts. So if we go here, contacts, automatic contacts, fusion is going to fuse or fix any surfaces that are within 0.1 millimeters of each other. So let's generate that contact now. Now, if we go to manage contacts, we'll be able to see that our contact set has been created and we have a bonded contact. There are other different types of contact, separation, sliding, rough, and offset bonded. Sliding would be if those two surfaces were frictionless. Rough would enable us to specify a coefficient of friction between those surfaces and so on. Now let's cancel that. And we're going to generate our mesh. Recall previously that a 10% mesh was adequate for this model, so I'm going to generate the standard mesh, which is a 10% model size mesh. I don't need to make any further changes before I run the simulation. So I'm going to solve. Okay, so despite our loading case appearing to be the same as previously, we notice some differences. First of all, our factor of safety has dropped to 2.83. And we also notice that the position of our principal stress has moved. You notice here that the position of the principal stress appears to be on the end of the shaft where the torque was being applied. Let's switch to stress view. And let's pan in on where the torque is being applied. You notice here that the principal stress has jumped to 73 megapascals, whereas previously it was 45.2. Now we need to be a little bit careful with these results because what we also notice is that the stress on the outside of the shaft is still hovering around 45 megapascals, which is what we would expect. So we need to try to understand a little bit more what's happening in this region. Now what we can do is we can adjust the visible scales. And so we will no longer be able to see the low stresses. We'll no longer be able to see stresses around 45 megapascals and we can isolate where those higher stresses are. Now what we notice is this is probably an anomaly associated with the boundary condition because the very high stresses only occur where the turning moment's being applied. So to a certain extent we can disregard this stress because we know that the principal stresses will be occurring on the shaft. The same torque is being applied the full length of that shaft. So although we've been able to generate results, we do have to apply a certain amount of logic to those results in order to determine whether the software is returning accurate results. In this instance, the likelihood is that the boundary condition that we applied is having a greater impact on the nodes that are close to that boundary. So once again, what this highlights is although the software has lots of practical applications and useful applications, we do need to be careful when we interpret those results to ensure that we're arriving at appropriate conclusions. In the next video, we're going to be applying FEA to another structural component, and we're going to be looking at a shelf bracket and the principal stresses on the shelf bracket, first of all, when it's unloaded or when it's isolated, and secondly, when a shelf is placed on top of the bracket.